Warning, I swear a lot. It is 3.43 in the PM and you're watching The Foreman. I'm your host, Foreman, and today, despite how sick I'm sure many of you are of the subject, because it pops up a lot on the channel at the moment, I wanted to talk once again uh, about Delta in an Undertale. More specifically, I want to talk about two fan games I played recently, Delta Traveler and TS Underswap. Now, if you had told me, uh, I don't know, maybe even a year or two ago that Foreman, you're going to play fan games and, and really enjoy them, be excited about them and talk about them at length, I wouldn't have believed you because fan games were just never something that really popped up in on my radar. I don't know what it was. There's nothing wrong with fan games at all, like in general. Absolutely nothing wrong with them, but it was just never something I was interested in. I regarded it in much the same way I regard things like fan fiction. And if you're into fan fiction, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's not my thing, you know? I'm, I often look at these sorts of things and I'm like, yeah, but it's not canon though, so why should I care? Having now played fan games, I understand it, of course, but before I had done, I, I didn't get it at all. I was like, what's the point? Now I get it. But Delta Traveler and TS Underswap are incredible. I thoroughly enjoyed both of my experiences, like playing both games, both going through Pacifist and Genocide on both games. And if you haven't uh, seen those videos, I think they're pretty good. The fucking Pacifist TS Underswap one is insane. It's like two hours and 15 minutes or something insane like that. But it becomes difficult when making videos like that, especially on games like Deltarune and Undertale, so obviously the fan games as well, in that I try to streamline all my videos as best I can. Like, I really do try and cut down as much as I can. Most of the videos that go up at the moment are about an hour long or so. They can, they would be a lot longer if I didn't. Right, I cut things out. I cut things down, trim footage, cut things out, down to like little three second sections and all the way up to like five to ten minute segments of like okay well nothing's happening right now or this context isn't necessary so i'll cut it out for the sake of the viewer so that it's not boring as it were and i don't have a problem with i don't mind doing that that's just how i like to make my videos that's my style i suppose i like to try and cut away as much of the chaff as possible i believe it was yahtzee croshaw who heard it somewhere else i don't know who told him but i heard him say on the subject of editing, I believe he was talking about writing, but it is applicable to video making, that you're not done when there's nothing more to add, you're done when there's nothing more to take away. Maybe I take that too far, I don't know, but I am rambling, I'm getting off topic. Delta Traveler, NTS Underswap. In a context like this, it's kind of hard to not pair them off against each other and compare them, and I guess that's kind of what I want to do for today's video. I should clarify that I don't really have a preference, because the two games are actually very different. They're very different experiences, which doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it from the surface, because they're both just basically retreading Undertale, right? And it's mostly the same characters, like... And it's the same gameplay as well, like how different could they possibly be? But they're actually, in my opinion, vastly different experiences. Delta Traveler is, I suppose, I would say it's more of a joke, but the reality of the situation is that like, yeah, uh, Rhino GG did come up with the idea as a joke and kind of the whole idea of the joke comes behind that very first scene where you land in the underground and Susie says, damn it, Chris, where the hell are we? But that's where the joke ends. And then beyond after that, it just becomes a really interesting and engaging experience. Seeing Chris and Susie interact with the residents of the underground, seeing them react to someone who is not, not Frisk, right? Seeing Susie resolve issues that Frisk could not resolve because Frisk was a small child and Chris is and Chris and Susie is big and strong and has a f put to put it bluntly a fuck you attitude as it were but not like trying to be cool fuck you attitude just you know Flowey tries to steal their souls and Susie's just like fuck off <laughs> go away bugger off whereas TS Underswap man it's hard to even talk about what TS Underswap is like. 
because I was like, oh yeah, sure. When I when I went into playing TS Underswap, when I started to play it, when I booted it up, my understanding of it was going to be everyone, like all the characters are there, but their roles, as it were, their places in the story, where they are, what they do, swapped around, right? So I was expecting Flowey to not be in that first room. I was expecting Toriel to not be the one who finds you and stuff like that. But what I got instead was a complete and utter reimagining of the underground entirely. Did any of you ever play the Master's Quest version of Ocarina of Time? That's like 20% of what uh, TS Underswap does, right? Because yeah, TS Underswap redoes the puzzles and stuff, but it doesn't just redo the puzzles. It also completely redoes the underground and completely changes how you progress through it and the events that take place and who's where and who's doing what and the only thing it doesn't change really is what people are like except for Temi who couldn't be more different. Temi was an interesting decision there. Not sure I could have really predicted it to the point where even when I saw Temi in the first room I was like well yes this is the place where you are attacked but I don't think Temi's gonna do it and then they did and then she did and you're like well, fucking hell. All right, cool. All right. Well, that went from zero to 100. I think the best thing about TS Underswap is the way it approaches Asgore. I think Asgore is, in my opinion, the best part of um, TS Underswap, purely because Asgore is the same near enough, which is like what I said before, you know, how everyone's the same, but they're in different places. Asgore is the same, he's just getting to act in a context in which he didn't originally get to do. In the original game, Asgore is the is the king looking for human souls and he has to make the hard decisions for the good of all the monsters of the underground. Whereas here, he is the caretaker of the ruined capital. And he's just doing his best to make life better for everyone around him. And he seems to be really good at it. Because He's stronger than Toriel, I think. I think. I'm only basing that off of the order of boss fights in Undertale, right? Maybe things are completely gonna be gonna be completely different in TS Underswap and Toriel is actually insanely strong. Not impossible. It's possible that Toriel already was insanely powerful, and it's just we never see it because she's never using her full strength against like Frisk, for instance. We don't know. But my point is that. Asgore is def definitely seems more suitable for leading and helping people and keeping a community together because in the original Undertale, all the monsters are just kind of scared of Toriel in the ruins, right? Like, the whole gameplay mechanic there is that you'll run into a monster and then she'll show up and glare at him and they'll run away, whereas in this one, and granted it only happens once, Froggett shows up, you can just talk to him or whatever, or just check him, or do nothing, do whatever you want, and Asgore immediately strolls up and goes, oh, hey, buddy, sorry, uh, we're kind of busy. Do you mind? And Frog is like, oh, no, sorry, sorry. And then they walk off, which makes attacking that frog it one of the worst things I've ever done. I hated doing that so much. I had to do it for the genocide. But, I, but because I knew the context in which that uh, conversation was going to go, how that encounter was going to go, attacking that frog it felt awful it felt so bad especially considering how horrified asgore looks when you do it because like the context the, the way that encounter goes doesn't change that frog it isn't attacking you right so you, you just have asgore try and make excuses for you like oh i'm sorry you i think you scared i think you scared them i think you scared the human um and they were acting in self-defense and the frog is like oh okay well i guess it's fine i'm just kind of not dying, but severely injured, but okay, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And it feels awful. And then you talk to the frog afterwards, and he goes, yeah, I'm sorry I scared you. And you're like, oh my god. I'm gonna have to kill you? Can't. That, that brings me, to, that does bring me to a good point, however. It brings me to a good uh, tangent. And as the genocide runs on Delta Traveler and TS Underswap, I think you can tell I have no structure for this, but... <laughs> Really, I thought about it before when I was talking about how these videos should have more structure, but really, this video that I'm doing right now is a chance for me to make something, but also kind of relax while doing it, because I am fucking... I am all over the place at the moment, making so much stuff, working at videos constantly, that I do need something that's just a little easier on me. But that's my bullshit. I apologize if these videos are a little unstructured, and it's very rambly, but... 
that's just how they are. I hope you don't mind too much, but back to the topic at hand. The genocide routes for both games are incredibly interesting, right? And they could just as easily have not been interesting, because... It's genocide, right? All you're doing is just murdering all the monsters. And you can have, and like, it would be easy to just have, be like, okay, you murder all the monsters, and then one, a couple characters tell you how horrible you are, and then you kill them as well, and then you move on. But they didn't quite do that. Delta Traveler is interesting, because it's not really, it is a genocide run, it's absolutely a genocide run, but it's also not. It's also, it's a blend of genocide and Snowgrave, and while those may seem like the same thing, they're not. A Snowgrave run on Undertale, on Undertale, on Deltarune, there's so many names here, man, Jesus. And bearing in mind, I assumed you could have gathered this already, but if not, I'm gonna say it now, massive spoilers for all, everything involved with Undertale and Deltarune, including Snowgrave and whatever, and these fan games, massive spoilers for all of it, okay? Don't assume I'm not going to say something that is a spoiler. Make sure you are fully caught up on those games before you continue listening, because otherwise I will spoil shit. But a Snowgrave route, a Snowgrave run, is not about killing every monster. Because you can ignore all the monsters before the specific point in Snowgrave where you have to initiate it, and you can ignore them again afterwards. The point of a Snowgrave run is kind, well, it's kind of to get someone else to do it for you. Really, the point of a Snowgrave route is to make Noel strong. And Chris kind of addresses that in um, Delta Traveler's quote-unquote genocide route. When you get Susie to kill Napster Blook, which is awful, by the way, and very well done, and very clever. And it is the only time you'll ever see Susie actually be horrified at something. Ever. Right. Even in... Even in all of Deltarune, she's not horrified at anything. She gets angry at the Chaos King for mistreating Lancer. She gets angry at the idea of Queen uh, replacing Noel's face with a robot one. But she's never horrified. But she is here. And best part, and like, I appreciate how that may sound, but even despite the fact that she's never been horrified of anything before, it doesn't feel out of character at all. It does not feel out of character for Susie to react that way, which is kind of the, uh... That's the clinch. That is just what it needs, like, because it could have just very easily come across as, um... Susie turning into a bleeding heart and she'd be like, oh, no, I don't want to hurt people. She doesn't give a fuck about that. She doesn't give a fuck about hurting people. It's just now, now after the events of, um, Delta in Episode 1, she's just more focused on hurting people who deserve it as opposed to just paying everyone. But here, you get her to kill someone who did not deserve it at all. Who was literally just in the way, and wasn't really even in the way. You could have quite easily gotten them to move out of the way. In fact, the way you beat that encounter uh, peacefully, thus ending the, the genocide run, is to just get Susie to talk to him. And then uh, Blucky's like, oh, okay, and then they leave. Or... Blucky asks you, are you going to beat me up? And you say no, and they go, oh, okay, and they leave. It's super easy to get them out of your way, to the point where it is actually harder to get Susie to kill them. It's unnecessary. And that's what makes it fucked up. And that's what disturbs Susie the most. It's like, we didn't, you went out of your way to get me to kill them. I don't know why I listened to you. Or at least that's sort of the avenue she started to go down, where she's like, I don't know why the fuck I listened to you, because that was horrific. But she still doesn't quite, like, you know, she, you're like her only friend, basically. Noelle's her friend now as well, but that's more romantic, and she doesn't really have any other, other friends. Chris is her only friend. So she's not eager to just abandon Chris immediately. So she kind of tries to be like, hey, you know, just calm down, right? I will deal with any problems we come across. I can deal with it. It's fine. Just chill out. But she's beginning to question you, as she should be. And I mentioned in the video, I think, that it was interesting to see how Susie, um... Has a bit more... Is, is, is a bit more resistant to you than, um, than Noel is. Because you're essentially doing the same thing here, where you're using Susie to kill him, the way you use Noel to kill him. But Susie's more resistant, because Susie is a stronger person, as it were, or at the very least... More willing to stand up for herself, I suppose. Maybe stronger is not the right term, maybe... 
more defiant, more confident in herself, more sense of self-worth, that kind of thing. Less scared, I suppose, more brave. Which means when you do this thing, she's more than willing to call you out and be like, why did you make me do that? As, as opposed to when you get Noelle to ice the shopkeeper, for instance, she's just kind of like, oh, okay, well, I guess we did need to do that because Chris said we need to do that. I should listen to Chris. Even though it's the player telling her to do that, yes, I know, I know. But as far as Noelle was concerned, Chris is telling her to do it. That context is important, however. I think it comes to a real interesting head when you meet Toriel during the genocide run of Delta Traveler and you go down like the full psychotic path where you're like, I feel great, I feel great, I've been getting stronger, we killed them all. And just before events there take place the way they do, Susie it does jump in and go, Chris, shut up, Chris, shut the fuck up, Chris, shut up, don't need this right now, shut up, stop going mental, shut up, she's, gonna, she's not going to like it. Where it's like, Susie can obviously tell that something's wrong, but she is willing to like, she, at any point, she is willing to dispute you or be like, you know, or cut you off or something. Just, she's willing to go against you. That's the main point, which leads me to believe that the end of a um, Delta Traveler's genocide route may well end with you fighting Susie, which would be dope. I don't know how Noelle will play into it, but if you're fighting Susie, I imagine Noelle will probably be on Susie's side. So I imagine that if you're doing a... Um, genocide route on a uh, Delta Traveler, you'll build up a party. I'm sure there'll be another member of the party, probably. I don't know. I don't fucking know. I'm guessing. But you'll be building up a party and then you'll have to fight the entire party because they'll be like, Chris, you fuck, you've gone off the deep end. You've, you've gone way off and you have to, we have to stop you. We should have stopped you before, in fact. But that's just pure speculation. But also, oh my God, the moment when Chris rips you out of them, when you're um, going full psycho talking to Toriel and Chris rips you out of their body and kills you is great. It is great because it confirmed what I said in the previous form and talks. Once again, I said this during the video, I'll say it now. Bearing in mind, this is not canon to the mainstream Deltarune series, but it at the very least confirms that I am correct about this in the context of Delta Traveler, that severe emotional pr responses or provocations provoking Chris by making them do things they don't want to do, making them say things they don't want to say, upsetting them, angering them, can causes them to get control back. And in that moment, it's interesting really, because it like I, I spoke about it at the time where I was like, kind of weird that a genocide route um, would have you take the, a less direct path, if you know what I mean, to not actually murder everything in your way, because in Undertale, Frisk would just, or Frisk turning into Chara, would just murder everything in their way. They would walk forward of their own accord. They would just, you know, people would be talking to them and they'd be like, I don't give a fuck, I'm going to kill you. My only intent is to kill you. I have no other intent. I'm not even sitting here and going to hum me, humor you with conversation. Nothing. No subterfuge, no trickery, no lying, no pretending. I am here for one purpose, and that's to kill. And that's what they do. But... Delta Traveler seems to tell you, no, you need to be a little smarter than that, actually, because you are not fully in control of your character. The alternate personality in your character's body in Undertale is Chara, and Chara's well up for it, and they are actually taking control away from you as you do more vicious things. In Delta Traveler, the other person in the body is Chris, and while Chris isn't a goody two-shoes, they do not want to murder everything in the underground, and as you try and push Chris to do more and more horrible things, they start to pull control away from you to stop you. And that's what makes the dream so interesting as well, where it's like, Chris is really going to be interested in trying to sever that link if it means stopping you, you the player, from continuing the rampage. I think it's interesting that Toriel's still alive, though. I wonder what's going to go on with that. Because, like, it's not... That's the thing, right? I've been calling Delta Traveler's genocide route a genocide route, but like I said, it's not a genocide route. It's a quote-unquote snow grave route. It can't be called... Weird route. We'll say weird route. I don't know. It's whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, it's not a genocide route. Because Toriel's still alive. That is one thing. But also because it's just not a genocide. Or at least it's not a genocide route in the way that Undertale defined it. 
because you can't play that way. Also, you didn't kill Sans the moment you saw him. You know? You didn't, or Sans didn't... Nah, this makes sense because you don't kill Sans the moment you see him in genocide anyway. There are differences. There are some differences. But it's not a genocide route. You may as well call it a genocide route. It's easier for the purposes of describing it. But it's something different. It's something interesting. And I quite like it. Also, the changes to the music in the uh, in the ruins. Oh boy. Great. Very good. Very, very good. I enjoyed it very much because it is so fucking creepy. And that like mid-tier deterioration of the ruins track before it goes into like basically the wind and the song playing really slowly, really faintly in the background is fantastic. I love that. I've listened to that in my spare time. Like I, as of an evening, after about eight or nine o'clock, I'll, I'll make myself a cup of tea and go out for a cigarette before coming back inside, usually to just play games and relax. And I would like listen to that on my headphones while I was out having a smoke. Just, it's nice. It's feel, it's got a tone to it. It's got a real sound, a real atmosphere. Last thing I wanted to discuss in terms of Dale Traveler's genocide route, and I guess it's not really specific to the genocide route, but it's what I did, is dealing with Flowey. Now that Flowey boss fight is incredible, actually. I love that boss fight because it occurred to me only while playing Delft Traveler that we have never fought Flowey in any game, right? We fought Omega Flowey and we fought Flowey's true form, quote unquote, with all seven souls. Well, six souls and all of the monster souls, but we've never fought Flowey as Flowey as just Flowey. And it was an interesting fight because he's dangerous. Sure, he's quite strong and he's dangerous, but he's not ridiculous. Combine that with the fact that it's a two on one fight. It's not that hard, actually. And yes, once again, this isn't only canon to Delta Traveler. It's not canon to anything else, but it lends a bit more credence as to what Flowey would say during a Undertale genocide route, where he's like, I just couldn't get past Asgore. I can't get past Asgore. I get those souls. I just can't get past him. And I'm like, every time he'd say that, I'd be like, I don't know, man. You're pretty fucking dangerous, right? I'm pretty sure you could deal with Asgore. But no, actually, with this context, I don't think he could. Asgore is pretty fucking strong. Asgore is extremely powerful and durable as well. The only reason Bowie manages to kill him during a genocide is because he hits him from behind, I'm pretty sure, with everything he had. And that was mainly out of desperation, probably, as well, which probably did something to that. It's probably not something he's ever tried, either, because he was never that desperate. But, yeah, now you get that context for, like, oh, wow, well, yeah, I don't think Flowey could break through and take the souls for himself. I don't think he is strong enough. He's still dangerous, sure. But it's just fascinating to get to actually fight Flowey. And as for striking the killing blow, because I know that's not genocide specific, as for striking this killing blow against Flowey, he's not dead. There's no fucking way he's dead. For a start, the game does not explicitly say he's dead. It says he is severe, the flower is severely damaged. Well, he's still alive then, isn't he? If he was dead, they would have written in that he's dead. But he's not dead, and it's also Flowey. There's no way. Flowey will continue to appear in Delta Traveler whether you hit him again, or whether you strike that final blow or not. That goes without saying, I don't think anyone is under any illusion that Flowey is dead if you strike the killing blow, because you're not striking the killing blow at all. He wants you to do it, but he always wants you to do it. And I swear, every time Flowey's like, yeah, kill me, go on, kill me, it's because Flowey knows you won't kill him. Either because you, as a person, won't do it, or because you physically can't. But I think that's all I want to say about uh, Delta Traveler's genocide route. This is a little bit of uh, a little bit of a uh, tangenting, a little bit of meandering, a little bit of going all over the place there. But that's just how I do. Let's talk about TS Underswap's genocide route because it is simultaneously more and less interesting, which is a strange thing to say. But I'll explain. TS Underswap's genocide route definitely adheres to Undertale's genocide route a lot more, which makes sense because it is more heavily, it's more firmly based on Undertale, weirdly. You would think that Delta Traveler being literally based in the actual, literal, exact copy of the Underground would be more like Undertale, but no, I'd say Underswap is more like Undertale, despite how different it is. I know this is confusing. But it adheres to the original genocide route a lot more. Because it's the traditional method, 
of achieving a genocide route where you literally have to keep killing until there's nothing left. Although they did they did it in quite a clever way in this one where it's like, keep swinging until there's nothing left, then go kill the uh, ruined knights. And then you are in genocide and you are pretty much locked in. I think you are pretty much locked in because I think the two people you fight afterwards, which is Metacrit and Asgore, will not accept your sp probably wouldn't accept your sparing. I don't know, I'll get to that in a minute. But the point is, it's a bit more like, uh, it's a lot more like Undertale's genocide route, including the, the, it's equivalent of, but nobody came, which was, what is it? It's absolutely silent. It's completely silent. It's deadly. Something silent. It's quiet. I can't remember the exact wording right now. Uh, I'm literally going to be editing that footage tonight of the genocide route, so I'll remember it and feel stupid, but... It has its own variant of that. The music cuts out. A very nice effect is that Chara's eyes disappear, or the main character's eyes disappear, because we don't actually know if it's Chara, but Jesus Christ, you look exactly like Chara, so I'd be really fucking surprised if Chara was not involved at all. But yeah, your eyes completely disappear, as in there's a shadow over your face. But... This does kind of lead to my problem with TS Underswap's Genocide Route, and that it is actually kind of boring for a lot of it. You get through the puzzle gauntlet, you take down the uh, ruined knights, and you're on that genocide route, baby. Everything's changed. Oh boy, here it comes. Here comes the massacre. Except not really, because the massacre's already happened. So there's not really anything left. The rest of the game just consists of walking around, kind of doing nothing. You get to the city, and I'm like, oh boy. Here we are at the- or actually first, you get to the dummy and I'm like, oh boy, I bet we fight the dummy. I bet we fucking fight the dummy. Nah, it's just- the, it's still the same. You just run away. There's a little bit of different dialogue where you refer to you as a killer, but all in all, the same. And you run away, and you end up in the sea. And you get to the sea and you're like, oh boy, I'm excited for murder. But there's no murdering to be done. Everyone just barricades the doors, hides in their houses, and the place is empty. Which, yes is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. It's nice to see you having an effect on the world, but there was so much potential for how horrible you could be in the sea, right? I'm surprised you don't fight the greasers. That's one that shocks me, because I'm like, that's a unique boss fight. That's a unique encounter. I'm really shocked that you don't fight them, because I, I've pictured them coming out in like a sort of, you know, they were a bunch of young hoodlums and they're like yeah we're gonna stop you because you've gone too far and then you absolutely crush them and it's uh, you know it's upsetting right it's another horrible tragedy that has occurred like asgore told us to hide but we you've got to be stopped and we're gonna stop you and then you you know and then you kill them but no nothing there they don't even pop up i checked the alleyway where you find them they're not there you can't go into grillby's flower shop's empty i think there are other locations i could have checked i didn't I guess, I think I, I don't think I checked everywhere, but the sea is empty, and yes, that is cool, but it's also kind of lame, because nothing happens, and there is a solid, uh, let's see, the video is about an hour and a half, it's roughly an hour, it took me roughly an hour and a half to complete a genocide route, not include, well, including the fact that Asgore took me more than one try, but we'll get to that in a minute, and I want to say about half an hour in, this is a very rough estimate. How, about half an hour in, I had killed everyone. And most of the gameplay was kind of done. And I don't know, it's just kind of... It felt a little... Floppy. We I mean, are just like, okay, you're done. Ah, fuck it. Go on, go ahead. You know what it ends in? It ends in a fight with you and Asgore, so go on, go. Get on with it. Keep moving. I don't know. I, I, to be fair, if they had put in too much chaff to cut through, as it were, it would have gotten pretty boring. So, fair enough. Better, you're not done when there's no more to add, you're done when there's no more to take away, right? Keep it streamlined, that's fine, but it does feel a little flaccid and a little empty. But, that's just my opinion. Mercrit fight was pretty cool, but it's exactly the same as the, um, pacifist version, where instead of acting through it, you just hit him until he dies. His goodbye, his death, it's quite good, quite well done, very upsetting, but uh, I wouldn't say anything to write home about. 
So we have this situation with uh, TS under swaps genocide run where we're like, if you picture a line graph, right? We were like up and now we've, and then we've gone down. But now we go way back up past the initial up, right? So it's like two minus two, five. We go up to five in the next bit. You arrive at Asgore's house, you're like, oh, I can't go in. Wow, they're really streamlining me. I guess I'll go fight him. And then you go see Asgore. Dude's fucking pissed. Dude is angry, right? The angriest you could ever see Asgore. And they don't even need, and like they've obscured his face, which is perfect. We don't, we didn't need TS Underswap to try and make him look angry in his expressions. Not necessary. All of that is done in dialogue. Excellent. Perfect. I think if Asgore had been sad, it might have actually been unbearable. So making him angry, very good. Very, very good. The fight itself, significantly, significantly harder than uh than the pacifist one, which 100% makes sense, because in the pacifist one, Asgore's just trying to test you, and he's actually just kind of trying to get you to back off, much like Toriel does in um in Undersell, where they, they want you to turn back, they want you to stay, it's too dangerous up ahead, stay here, stay here. They're not trying to kill you, they're trying to get you to go back in the house. Or at least test you to see if you're strong enough. You know? They're trying to test you, they're not trying to kill you. So they're not going all out. But in Genesis, and like, I think that's kind of a weakness of Undertale's genocide route actually, where Toriel isn't tougher in the genocide route because she should be trying to put you down by that point, but it's possible. I can't remember the details. Maybe she's not fully aware of what you've done. Um, But in this one, Asgore goes ham. He fucking goes for it. I would argue that the Asgore fight in, um, in TS Underswap in, on the genocide route is harder than Asgore in Undertale. Probably harder, actually. I'd almost certainly say that's harder. Although there are some attacks in um, Undertale's version that are really hard to deal with, so it's iffy, but they do add some attacks in this one that are really hard to deal with, and you, but you feel it that Asgore is trying to put you down. Asgore is 100% trying to kill you, and it's great. Whereas, at least in Undertale, you can feel there is some hesitation on his part. Grim Resolve but he doesn't want to do it. Here, he needs, he wants, he definitely is trying to put you down, 100%. He's not happy about it, but he knows it has to be done. And the end of the fight, like towards the end of the fight where his health is getting low and he starts talking again and he's just getting angrier and angrier and you're like, this is great. And then the end of the fight, we've literally got his health down to zero and he has his last hurrah attack, which wiped me out the first time because I was not expecting it at all, which upon retrospect, the last part of that where he's just sending a bunch of projectiles at you is not actually that bad. It's actually pretty simple. But the bit before that with like fucking five or ten trident stabs is so hard to dodge that you often have so little health by the time the projectiles show up that you have to be perfect and you just slip up like once or twice and then you die and you're like, ah, oh, fuck. But it's really good. It's really well done. I love challenge. I think I... Maybe this will be an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. I think Sa Sans was too hard. I think Undyne the Undying was just at the right level of hard, right? Perhaps starting to teeter over to too hard? Sans is too hard. That was absurd. Now, I get that that's the point, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But I think as far as a fight goes, Sans is too hard, and any attempt to replicate that in a in a fan game is not necessary and would damage the experience because it's just i like a challenge you know me i love a challenge but there is a difference between facing a challenge and smashing your head against a wall and sans is nine brick walls all reinforced with concrete and spikes right that's absurd asgore in this just the right level of difficulty just satisfying and challenging to fight against just just right. I'd say Undying the Undying still takes the cake for being like the perfect balance, but Asgore was very good. But what interests me, because I have not researched this, I haven't looked into it yet, is the hug option in the genocide route after you do all this. Now, I imagine there's a distinct possibility that nothing comes of it, or that it just procs more dialogue, but I didn't pick it because I was scared that it would end my genocide run 
And yes, I could have fought Asgore again and beaten him, but I didn't really want to because I had worked quite hard to get there. And I was like, no, I just want to, I just want to do it. Basically, I just want to see what's going to happen in the genocide run. I don't want to hug him for that reason. Also, uh, you know, the emotional trauma, which is very real. But that was interesting to see that that was there in that in those final moments. You try to talk to him, it's like literally you've got nothing to say. There's no, no words to justify or explain what you've done, which is great. But that fight was fantastic. And the follow-up, the follow-up, the follow-up with the Temi scene is dope. Because you go from walking in the pacifist route, you walk in there and you are scared, right? You're not, not literally scared because it's not a horror game and it's not really a horror thing, but you are intimidated at the very least because you're like, these guys could kick my ass, right? All these Temmies, they'll fucking murder me. And that is, in fact, their intention. But in Genocide, you walk in there, and they all show up, and they're not threatening you. They're like... Not groveling. Groveling's not quite the right term. They're like appeasing you. They're like looking up to you. They're like, you're the dude. You're the fucking guy. And you literally... And, and your little character is just there. And doesn't say anything, of course, because the main character never does. But you can practically hear... You can practically hear them look at the Temmies and just go, Fuck off. <laughs> and they're like, Ah, uh, I don't think he's on our side. <laughs> and it goes from being like this scene which is really scary in Pacifist, to being super satisfying in Genocide where you're just like, Back off. All of you, back off. I will... I. Not only will I kill you if we come to blows, but I'm probably going to do that anyway. That's actually my plan walking into this room. All the Temmies run away. The main Temmie's the only one left, and you just walk towards them like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking bang you out, bruv. <laughs> Say goodbye. And then Flowey turns up. And wow, TS Underswap's done a good job of Flowey, which is interesting because he has so few lines. But Flowey is fascinating in TS Underswap because he's playing both sides. He literally seems to be playing both sides. Now, in Pacifist, he gets the Temis to back off by threatening to call Asgore. But Asgore doesn't know that Temi, that uh, Flowey exists in TS Underswap because he says, I, I even heard there might be a golden flower monster. Heard that there might be, which means he hasn't seen Flowey. So it's not like he's buddies with Asgore. He just knows that the Temis are scared of Asgore. So he could go get them and then he would wreck the Temis. So he's not buddies with Asgore, he's not like a positive role model in the community. But from a standard pacifist playthrough, you could be like, oh, okay, in this game, Flowey's chill and Flowey's nice, or maybe he's pretending to be, we don't know, but it's possible that he could be nice. Yeah, maybe he's a good guy in this game. And then he shows up in Genocide and he's like, and he congratulates you for everything you've done. And he's like, and he's well on board with everything you've done. But one of these could simply, one of these outcomes could be Flowey appeasing to you, appeasing you, and like playing up to you, and the other could be his true nature. Is he actually violent in this one, like he is in actual Undertale, or is he actually nice and he's trying to, I don't know, be a friend to sort of get you back on the right path? I don't know. All he's described as in your journal is your best pal or your new pal or whatever. And I think that might actually be his role in Underswap. I think it's just pure conjecture, not based on anything other than that ju that journal entry. I think Flowey's character, his existence in Underswap, is to either be your friend who goes along with everything you choose to do, or be your friend and then betray you. Or it, hmm, it's hard to say. It might turn out quite similarly to Undertale, whereas in in a pacifist route, the, in a pacifist under swap route, uh, Flowey will betray you eventually for his own purposes. And in genocide, he's 100% on your side, but you'll end up killing him because it's a genocide route. And the under swap genocide route is a motherfucking genocide route. Your character doesn't fuck around. Anyone they can get their hands on, they kill. But I can't imagine that the creators are going to go for something so similar to what Undertale did because they've subverted so many expectations up to this point. I can't imagine they'll go the exact same way. But this isn't related to genocide, I just only just remembered it. What is up with the dialogue options when talking to Asgore in his house? 
I, I achieved it during the pacifist run, but this literally would apply to any run that isn't genocide. He's talking to Asgore and it's like, can I stay here? And then you go to move the cursor over to the option and it switches to where's the exit. And then it's like, help me. And I didn't say that. What's going on with that? I didn't explore the house on Pacifist and I wish I did. I wish I did because exploring the house in Genocide was fascinating. But I, the reason I didn't do it in Pacifist is because that video was already dragging on super long and I was trying to wrap it up. But I need to go back and look because, oh boy, there's some stuff going on there for real. I, I do need to go back through and do a Pacifist playthrough anyway because I want a save file with all the quests done and everything uh, dusted off before I continue like when they do their next part so I'll be going back to explore those but man what does that mean because we are establishing now the idea that there is you know it's similar to Undertale where it, there is the two personalities there is another personality in there that takes control away from the player because in pacifist you have your dialogue changes the dialogue options changed and in genocide the character moves on their own which Look, if you're going to put that much work into a fucking Undertale fan game, you're not just making having the character move on their own because, oh, well, Genocide did it, Undertale did it in Genocide, and that was pretty cool. No, you would understand why that was a thing. So they're not just throwing it in as an homage to Undertale's Genocide. They're doing it because they know why that happens, and they're applying it here as well. These people are smart. These devs, these writers, they're smart. They're clearly smart. They know what they're doing. The question is, is it Chara? Because aren't you Chara? Isn't the character you're literally playing as Chara? There's been no reference to a human child in Underswap. It just occurred to me. There have been there have been humans who have gone through and died. Yes, yes, yes. We've all been through that. Yeah, we know that. Six, I think six have gone through and died or something. I think that's what Asgore said. Can't remember, don't quote me. But no one I have spoken to in Underswap has mentioned Chara, basically, the king and queen's hum adopted human child who, you know, died and, and and Asriel took their soul and went off to um, kill the humans or whatever, and then Asriel stopped it. But by the same... Actually, now that I think about it, there's been no reference to Asriel dying. No one has said anything about Asriel dying. Flowey exists, that implies, that heavily implies that Asriel is dead, quote unquote. But it's not impossible, it's not impossible that Flowey could come from somewhere else. Who's to say it has to be Asriel's dust that would make Flowey? It's a soulless monster inhabiting a flower. Or it's a, I don't know how else better to describe that, but you know what I mean. It's a, it's a living being without a soul that inhabits a flower. Doesn't have to be Asriel at all. It could be anyone. It could be Toriel. I think Toriel is alive. I think the queen has been mentioned. I don't think it's her. But it doesn't necessarily have to be Toriel. It have, have to be Asriel. It probably is. I'll say there is like a 90, 80 to 90% chance that Flowey is Asriel and this and they, they haven't changed that. But it could be. It could be different. We don't know. It's fascinating. There's so much going on there. There's so much going on in both games. There is so much mystery and foreshadowing and, and and potential plot hooks going on in both games. Both of them, bearing in mind both of them right now are essentially demos limited to the ruins, are fascinating. So fascinating. And to the point where I don't give a... It almost doesn't matter to me that they're related to Deltarune or Undertale in any way. As their own entities, exceptionally interesting, and I hope they treat them as their own entities, as it were, where it's like, we don't need to follow all of the rules established by Undertale and Deltarune. I hope they keep that in mind, that they don't need to do that. Sit back, look at the broader picture. Say, for instance, oh, well, we can't do this because, um, I don't know, you always fight Papyrus at this bit. That doesn't have to be the case does not have to be the case at all. We can't do this because, um, uh, I don't know, fucking Alphys has to do this, so we can't do that. Why? Why Why does Alphys have to do that? Change the story. Do whatever the fuck you want. 
It's your fan game. You can literally go nuts. And they have been going nuts. And I hope they continue to go nuts. Because what they've come up with, both Rhino GG and Team Switched, are incredible. And I'm so excited to see what they're doing. But we've reached roughly that time again, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I barely had anything interesting to say as it is. I don't have anything more interesting to say. It's time to wrap up for the day. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think, man? <laughs> like, what do you, dude, what do you think? What do you think about uh, Delta Traveler and TS Underswap? What do you think? Where do you think they're going? What do you think they're going to do? What do you want them to do? Let me know. Let me know. Drop a comment. I'll be interested to hear about it. Do you think I'm stupid? I mean, I assume you tell me that anyway, so I'm not even going to tell you to do that. But, uh, yeah. That's the end of Forma Talks, whatever I talk about next time, and I actually don't know, but I do have a suspicion. It might be based on the thing I recorded today, which took goddamn ages. It's an interesting little number that I think you guys may or may not enjoy. It's not related to Deltarune or Undertale at all, so hey, if you're not into that, if you're not into Deltarune and Undertale, then good news, it's something different. But whatever happens next time, and whatever I talk about, hope I see you there. Toodles. Goodbye.